What's going on, everybody? It's Cooper and James, and we are from the Back Pens. Today, we have a special episode for you guys. We had the chance to sit down with Ty Ronaldo and Don Cardona. Ty is a stock contractor, a bull owner. He's got a lot of really good bucking bulls, and he hauls them at the professional level. And Don is a filmmaker, and he followed Ty around for a while, made a really awesome documentary called Bucking Bulls, that showcases the the behind the scenes life of what a stock contractor does and it's a really awesome film they did a really great job with it if you like bull riding like bucking bulls like rodeo or just like a good story and so today we are going to play our interview with ty ronaldo and don cardona so let's get right into it Are you guys ready for some bull riding? You gotta be kind of about half wild and crazy and not have a care in the world to be a bull rider. I'm not nervous yet, but it might be different once I get in there. One of the best coaches I've ever worked for. You guys are training your minds right here, so make sure you do it perfect. I learned a lot about life from riding bulls. Keep that elbow out front, home base. Oh, man. Bull riding's a verb. You've got to be moving. It looks easier than it is. There you go. Get out of there. Let's go. When they start praying, go get ready. We couldn't have bull riding for what? For good animal athletes. Every one of them's got a personality just as different as people. Without the stock contractors and the bulls, I mean, that's half the sport. I just love it when people come out and they see us interact with these bulls and how we treat them and how well respected they are. He's taking bulls to the PBR finals and the national finals. There's not anything about bull riding that Ty doesn't love. He loves his bulls. He wants a bad. You all right? Good job, bud. It's hard to imagine the forces that happen in eight seconds. The last of the night. Like J.B. Mooney always says, if you can't put it out of your mind for eight seconds, then you may as well not be doing it. Words can't describe the feeling what it is to ride bulls. So today we have a special treat for you listeners out there. We have Don Cardona and Ty Ronaldo on with us. And these two kind of paired up to make a pretty unique documentary, in my opinion. It really showcases the behind the scenes aspect of a stock contractor and an event producer as well. So Don and Ty, how did you guys kind of link up and kind of come up come up with this documentary? Well, I will try and keep this as brief as I can. When I was younger, I, I was a cameraman uh, working on ESPN events and I became a bull riding fan when I worked one of those events. I was a cameraman on the shoot. And so I just watched it over the years on TNT and Versus Network and, uh, and just kind of had an effect, aff- affection for it. And I moved back to Colorado, saw that Ty was producing some uh, events down in Castle Rock, Colorado, took some neighbors to the event. And while I was there, my neighbor told me that they tied a rope around the bull's private parts. And so it made me start questioning why I was supporting this sport. Uh, and I couldn't stop thinking about it for the rest of the evening. And I, I knew Ty from high school. He was a year ahead of me. We didn't really know each other that well, but I thought I wanted to uh, you know, meet up with him at the end of the night and just reintroduce myself. So I did. And uh, Ty invited me down to his ranch um, just so I could see. And it was about the same time I, I was thinking, because I do video for a living, I was thinking, you know, it'd be interesting to follow you around and, and see what you do. Well, when I asked him about the rope issue, he said it, it was a big myth. And and I asked him, well, what's the rope for? And he said it's, it encourages him to kick. It tickles him. And so I was still a little skeptical, but I can, I asked him if I could follow him around for whatever events he had. And Ty was gracious enough to allow me hundred percent access. And I basically shot whatever I could, nothing was hidden. So I kind of understood uh, over the course of the year, what went into it and, uh, and put it together, you know, a year and a half later. And, uh, and it turned into a documentary that I was only intending for short clips to go on social media. So that's kind of my perspective on it. I'd, I'd love to hear Ty's version of this. <laughs> I'm not sure there's anything <clears throat> left to say, but uh, yeah, it was, it was just, it was a really fun process and, you know, he'd come out and he'd film us loading bulls and he'd film us going to events. And he was sitting in the passenger seat as we're driving to the event and he just got every aspect of it and filmed the event. And then 
coming back and unloading bulls, you know, just kind of from start to finish. And, and then he goes in depth in a lot of different areas, which, which I, I appreciated and uh, just built a great friendship with a great man. And it's been a fun project. Heck yeah. That sounds like a really fun time in my opinion. And one thing I know I told you when we first talked, Don, is I thought the representation you gave not just Ty, but everybody that raises bucking bulls was really great. And I think there's not enough of that out there, especially for people that aren't informed about the sport. I know we touched on this too. There's just a lot of misconceptions out there. And Ty, I'm sure as a bull owner, you run into those kind of people on a somewhat regular basis. How do you tend to handle those kind of talks or confrontations with people that either just are misinformed or just dead set against it? Like you can't change their mind. It's negative. I don't like it. Never going to like it. How do you handle that kind of stuff? Well, I, I like, I like it when you say talk, because when it becomes a confrontation, then it's, then it's not friendly anymore. And I, I, I avoid that stuff when we're talking about our bulls. Cause I, I love to educate people on the way these bulls are treated. And, you know, first they're part of our family and they're, they're kind of weird pets and, but they're, they're, they're our pets, just like a dog or a cat. And, uh, you know, we care for them. They all have a name and they're on a feed program. They're on a, a workout program and we take care of them best we can. And, and it's, it's funny that the, the way they've all got a personality, just as different as the four of us on here are um, in our lives. These bulls are, are just as different. You know, they've all got their own personality. Some of them, when you're graining them in the morning, they'll come right up to you and you know, kind of headbutt you a little bit, not to be mean, just to get you out of the way so they can eat their grain. And and then you've got some of those others that you better be watching out for, because if they're going to headbutt you, they're going to hurt you. But um, no, they're just they're just fun, you know, and we've we've got some that you can walk out there and scratch and some that'll come across the fence from you and you stick a, a horse cookie out through the fence and they'll eat horse horse cookies out of your hand. And, and they truly become part of our family. And it's uh, it's always hard to see them go when we either sell them or, you know, maybe they pass away from old age and, and it's tough to see them go, but, uh, but we love them. Absolutely. And speaking of that, you had a handful in Billings, Montana, which was ironic because we had planned on doing this podcast prior to that. And then all of a sudden you had bulls there and we don't, we don't see you often enough. I don't feel like on the, on the Unleash the Beast tour and, Thanks to the Cowboy Channel, now we can follow Pro Rodeo a lot, a lot better now than we used to before. As far as uh, how your bulls perform and things like that, could you enlighten us with a little bit more detail of kind of you know your workout programs and how to how to take just a? I mean, I know it's mostly genetics, but say it's like say you found one at a cell barn that you wanted to train to be a bucking bull. How do you start them and how do you get them to the point where they're at a PBR level for people that don't necessarily follow it enough or understand that there's a lot more to it than just showing up with your bulls and hoping they buck? You know, we, we get a lot of calls from guys around that, you know, man, I got a, I got a great bucking bull and, and here, can I send you some videos? And, and I love to look at those and we like to buy bulls that are, that are two or three years old and, and maybe, you know, maybe aren't fed quite right. And maybe they don't work them out and, and keep them in shape. And, and I, I like to buy those kind of bulls. Cause I always think that, man, I can make him better, whatever, however he's bucking right now. I, I think I can make him better. So we like to buy those kind and then get them home and beef their feet up. We we've got, we had some guys fly out here from Oklahoma uh, that have a, a grain mill in Oklahoma and they, they came out and they built a feed just for our bulls. You know, they, they came out and asked us questions about the altitude, the weather, the temperature, and then the bulls. How do you want the bulls to look? Are they sprinters? Are they marathon runners? You know, what do you want? And, and so we had a, a, a feed built just for them. So it's specialized for bucking bulls that live at this climate in this weather and uh, so they're on a great feed program. And, and just like I said, you know, their personalities are just as different as, as the four of us. Well, they, they metabolize food just as different as the four of us. They metabolize food different also. I mean, some of them can look at hay and gain 50 pounds. And so you kind of got to be careful what those kind of bulls eat. Um, most of the bulls here, we grain in the morning, they get 10, 
10 to 15 pounds per bull in the morning. And this time of year, when it's still getting pretty cold out, we give them free choice hay. Um, so they can come and go and eat the hay 24 hours a day, however they choose. But we got to watch them because they can sure get overweight that way. And some of them uh, get overweight pretty easy, and but most of them don't. But then we, uh, we get them and feed them right and we exercise them. They're athletes and uh, we, we work them out. We run them in the arena with a four wheeler and, um, you know, make sure they're, they're in shape and that decreases injuries and, uh, and allows them to buck better. And then we just take them to events. Now, now babies, we don't deal a lot with, with raisin bulls. We used to, and um, I just got kind of too impatient for that whole process. You know, you have a baby born and you kind of have to wait two or two and a half years before you can really start using them. Um, but we've got a few calves here out of a, a bull perfect storm that I used to own that went to the PBR finals in 2015. So we've got some bulls and I, and I, I enjoy working with those young bulls and they're yearlings right now. And, and we've, uh, we've worked them through the shoot probably five times, uh, never bucked them. I think they're still too young and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to burn them out. I'm just going to, we take it easy with them. We open gates, we let them find their way, we get them in the buck and shoot. We, you know, we have a broom that we kind of pet them with over the buck and shoot and just, you know, get them to know that nobody's going to hurt them, nothing's going to happen to them. Turn them out, let them go back and eat. And then, you know, a couple weeks later or a month later, bring them in and do it again. And, um, and they're to the point now where, you know, they're not freaked out by coming in and they're not freaked out at people. And, and that's what we want. And, and going back to, uh, to educating people, um, I got on an airplane to Atlanta from Denver to Atlanta. We were, my bulls were out there um, at the Georgia dome. And so I, I get on the airplane with my cowboy hat on and this guy sitting next to me, he's a, a businessman. And he asks where I'm going. I told him Atlanta for the bull riding and we got to talking and he said, yeah, well you'd buck too. If they, they wrap that flank around your privates and, and, uh, and we had a, a couple hour conversation about bucking bulls and, I, I invited him to the event at the end of our conversation, and um, I think he became a bull riding fan. And I hope he went to the event. So I, I I enjoy educating people about our bulls. I'm really glad that you brought up how some of them will gain weight really easily, and some won't. And you can definitely tell too when you brought up maybe a bull isn't getting fed right. I've been on bulls where you could grab them and you go to pull hide out, and it's a handful. But when you're getting on one that's getting fed right, I mean, you might get your fingertips. You know, that's yeah. a, that's a big difference. And at that level, at the pro level, you're not going to see too much difference. But at the lower levels of bull riding, that's something that is really apparent to me. You can definitely tell when they're in shape. And if they're overweight, it's a lot harder for them to be athletic and do what you want them to do. So it definitely yeah. shows the effort you guys put into keeping these animals in shape and feeling good so they can do their deal when the gate opens. Yeah. Well, thank you. And some of them, we've got one bull here that belongs to my son that he's so high strung and it's frustrating that he eats exact same as everybody else. He eats 10 to 15 pounds of grain every morning and he, he's got full-time hay and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's maybe 50 pounds underweight and he's just so high strung, you know, his head's always in the air and he's always watching. He just never he'll never relax to where his body can kind of absorb some of that good feed and, and allow himself to grow. But uh, yeah, you just, you know, they're, they're all different and you just gotta, sometimes you gotta feed one a little more, get them by themselves, feed them a little more. And sometimes you gotta get one by themselves and feed them a little less. What are your thoughts on giving bulls CBD and stuff like that for, for that kind of purpose of this this one here's too wiry, and we need to just calm him down so we can get the proper nutrition and things like that, and maybe injuries. I've never used it. I have used uh, Jim McLean, a bullfighter in Oklahoma, has got uh, got the two bulls, and he sent me some some de stress, some bull de stress. I had a bull that when we traveled traveled with him, he wouldn't drink, and just just you know he was fine at the house, but he did not like to travel. And Jim sent me some de-stress and, and that sure worked for that bull. I've never tried the CBD, but, uh, you know, I, I think it works for people and, and I don't see why it wouldn't work for bulls, but, uh, I've, I've not tried it. So kind of going off that theme of educating, 
Don, so you spent time being a cameraman at ESPN and being right there up close to the action on the back of the buck and shoots. How eye-opening was it for you during this process to really see how much effort and the detail that goes into keeping these animals able to perform? Well, the first thing I would say is it is incredibly difficult to capture the intensity of a bull and the rider chemistry when they're together. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do during the shoot was use the camera angle or the lens focal length to get as close as I could without getting too tight. Uh, there was one director that I worked with many, many years ago who said, uh, and I'll, I'll use the, pro the uh, polite language. He said, a tight shot of poop is poop, right? So if you're not seeing it properly, it doesn't make any sense. It won't make any sense because it's not in context. So I tried to be very careful with wet, the way I shot. I liken bull riding a lot to hockey. If you've ever been to a hockey game or if you've ever seen it on TV, it's a different experience than when you're in the arena because you can smell the cold air and feel the, feel it. And when they crash into the gates, you can feel that when you're in the arena. Uh, when it's on TV, you, you can hear it, but it doesn't translate the same way. And I, I feel like bull riding is a lot like that. And so the way I approached shooting was to try and get that feeling. So in the documentary, you'll hear a lot of sounds, uh, natural sounds that hopefully can kind of bring you in there, but really there's no way of capturing that feeling when that happens. And like I said earlier, you know, when I was a cameraman on that ESPN gig, it was intense. And that's really what hooked me because I, I mean, the first thing that I thought of is these guys are nuts, but I didn't understand anything about the sport until really I visited with Ty and I got to experience the bull riding schools and the practices and, and just these guys taking their lives in their hands every time they get in there. I mean, even the stock contractors, if they're not careful, they could get run over and, and, and hurt. And I know that that's happened to Ty a few times. Um, obviously I don't have that footage to, as a, as him being a stock contractor, but, and fortunately I didn't get to see anything happen in that respect, but that's, that's the best way I think I can describe it. So kind of going off of what Don said there about the intensity and maybe the lack of it you get from watching, Ty, do you ever deal with students that come up to a school and they've seen it a bunch on TV, but maybe they haven't been up close and personal with it before? Can you see that it's like a old crap moment? Like this is not what I thought it was going to be like from watching it on TV. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, the PBR and the, uh, all the TV footage and the, the big money, you know, that's that's brought a lot of people into the sport. A lot of a lot of athletes um, that that weren't really rodeo people. And, um, yeah, we've got them that come to the school and, and they'll, you know, we we spend half a day going through drills and equipment and instruction. And um, and then we'll take them to the bucking shoots the after lunch that first day. We don't just take them right to the shoots. Um, they're the first morning, so they've got a lot of instruction and a lot of learning to do. And then we'll take them to the bucking shoots, and they get on that first bull. And, and many times they come back and say, wow, this is way different than it looks on TV. And if I can add, uh, you know, w there's one part of the film that I thought was very key. Anyone who gets on has to have a little bit of macho, right? Uh, even, even from the women's perspective, that they're brave. And there's one part that I included in there that I thought was very poignant. And that was when Ty said to the students, uh, if any of you want to get on a bull, great. If not, probably even better. And I thought that was really a really interesting comment because no one at the schools who's, who's in that position of, of coaching and training wants anybody to get hurt. And if you're not feeling confident about it, you're probably going to get hurt. And so I think that that, that just kind of goes to the care that I saw in the coaching and, and, you know, people are getting on for the first time, maybe it's a life goal or a bucket list or something. And, and, I, and just to hear things like that. Um, and, and then the other part that I didn't capture properly, I think there was audio issues with it. It's taking care of the bulls. Like I don't, you, you do not do this because a stock contractor will rip your head off if you do. I, I appreciate that. And um, with, with that, you know, we, uh, all the drills and the instruction on that first morning, and then all the drills we put them on, the, the broke saddle horses that we put them on bareback and lead them around, and the drills, the dummies, we consider that to be 
the homework and the studying and, and the work. And then when they go to the buck and shoots, we consider that the test. So the, the reason I ask them in that way, who wants to get on? If you guys want to get on, we'll buck all the bulls. We want to buck today. But if you don't, maybe even better, because I'm not sure some of those people put in the work and the time and the effort on the drills and the study and the homework part to go take the test. You know, we don't want to just stick them on a test and, and, and have them fail right away. So, so we need to make sure that they've done their homework. And, and, and most of these students are brand new. I mean, they've never been, never been to a school, never been on a bull. And Lyle just, Lyle Sankey just does a great job. He, uh, you know, he provides equipment, you know, for these for these students to use. Um, they don't have to buy it. And if they, you know, they decide at the end of the school that, man, I love this bull riding, then they can buy whatever they want if they want. But if they don't like bull riding at the end of the school, they turn it all back in. But that's uh, that's a huge benefit because some of them don't like it. I think that is a huge benefit. But I noticed in the documentary, at least it mentioned that you had two schools per year. Is one of them like a beginner and then one of them an advanced or does it really matter? No, sir. It, they're, they're both the exact same. And we take students of all ages. We take students of, uh, we take men and women, uh, boys and girls. And depending on their age, they're either in the, the steer riding or the junior bull riding or the big bull riding. And, um, and, and we've got great bulls for these students to learn on. You know, they're great big brendles and big horns and they man they look the part but it's so cool to watch them watch the shoot gate open and they just come out and they just kind of hop around and and uh and it's what these kids need to be tested on to see to see how they're doing on their drills after they come take the test but to answer your question no we don't they're both the schools are the same and it can be anybody any age um at any level so the last thing I kind of want to talk about with the school, and it's something that I think is kind of underrated, underrated when you're watching bull riding on TV is you guys really stress getting out of there. And the reason I think it's important is I just saw an incident here at an extreme bulls. I was working a couple of weeks ago is the guy got off and kind of got ran over. But when, when he got ran over and got back up, he basically just walked back to the buck and shoot, had his back to the arena. And the bullfighters did what they could, but he ended up getting hooked in the buck and shoot and he threw him back out into the arena. And I know that the bullfighters in the arena were sitting there, you know, man, like what could we have done differently? You know, blah, blah, blah. And they took it to heart. And I thought that was really great that you guys really stressed that because it's not over until you get to the fence or over the fence. Yeah. And one step ahead of that, you know, the, the, the dismount, is just as much a part of the of the procedure as as the riding, and I was bad about that. You know, when I heard the whistle blow, I was just so thankful. You know, I did my job that I didn't really care how the dismount went. And man, that dismount is so important. And we go over that, we teach it, we drill it. And you know, if if you can have a good dismount, that allows you so much so much better and easier to to get out of there. But yeah, the in, in the film that that big Brendel I'm talking about that comes out and just hops around that kid rode him and made a great ride and got off of him and just kind of walked out there. And I, I, I thought, God, and, and I kind of, kind of got upset with him. Um, but you got to get out of there. And, and at, at the upper levels, um, like the, like the um, unleash the beast tour of the PBR. I mean, you've got three of the absolute best bullfighters and it's so fun to watch them last weekend. And, and Billings, I was watching those guys, and they make a triangle around that bull. And, I mean, that bull has almost zero shot at getting that guy. And, and you know, that guy can, can get out of there once and kind of trot off. And, and those, those three guys, they've, they've just got it. But, but, you know, bullfighters at all these other levels, they're, they're you know, maybe, maybe learning, maybe not quite that, that experience or level as these guys that are, that are doing the PBR deals. And, and so, you know, you've got to learn to, to get off right and give yourself a shot to get out of there. And then once you hit the ground, man, go get out of there, get over the fence. I, uh, I tore my knee up real bad one year 
um, from not getting, I got run over, but then I didn't get over the fence and he smashed me again and, and I put me out for a long time. So you got to get over. Definitely. And it's uh, really neat to kind of seen that process for anybody that's never been to schools. I've been to some schools that were local about 10 minutes from my house. So it was neat to see somebody else's take on it and kind of how you, you're supposed to get irritated at those students for not getting out of there and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of that and Cooper and probably everybody on this podcast would agree with it. A lot of that is what they see on TV because those guys were so experienced at the PBR level with those bullfighters, like Tide said, that those guys, sometimes they know this bull's hot. No matter what we do, we better get in there and get out of there. Sometimes they're down. Sometimes they just made a great ride and want to celebrate for a while. But if that's all they see, that's all they know. And so it's great that somebody's teaching them, you know, the right way to get in and out of there. So I know, Don, you said you and Ty had went to high school together, but how much did you know before you started this process about Ty's riding career? The only thing I remember was because of my yearbook. I was flipping through my yearbook mm, maybe a month after I started shooting this project. And I don't, I wasn't even looking for, to find out about Ty. I was just flipping through it for some reason. And I saw a picture of Ty. And, uh, and so I, it was said bull riding Colorado state champion. And that's when I remembered, oh, wow. So it happened after I had the sit down interview with him and really, I didn't understand or know because, you know, we go our separate ways. I have a different career ties, uh, doing his own thing. And then when I, when I sat and interviewed him, um, it didn't really sink in when, cause Ty is so humble that I, you know, he's, I won a couple of high, you know, championships in high school and college and whatever. So I didn't really think much of it. And then I talked to his, um, his wife then who, who was his wife at the time. And she told me that he was ranked 12th in the world and, and in the PRCA. And, and he was on his way to that route to being a, a, a world champion. And, uh, and I didn't even know that he traveled with Cody Custer at the year that Cody won his championship. So it just kind of came as I was shooting again. And I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but this project was only supposed to have been short clips for social media. But then in 2019, I never had the chance to sit down with it. So I sat on my hard drive. And when I did actually put these pieces together, a friend of mine said, try it as a full documentary and see what you got. And that's, and that's kind of what happened. So I, you know, to answer your question, I kind of discovered the history of Ty just by being a part of it. It wasn't like Ty was giving me much good information. Thank you very much, Ty. <laughs> but I don't think he understood. He didn't know what I was looking for. And I didn't know what to ask because I was still relatively new to the sport. Yeah. And that would be challenging. I mean, I would try to think like we talked about privately too, is you were telling me about covering kayaking and like, I wouldn't have the first clue. So I can definitely see where it would be challenging, but Ty, after watching, I didn't know a whole lot about you before I watched the documentary. I knew you had buck and bulls, but as far as, you know, the details that came out in the documentary, I didn't know much about it. So I thought it was really cool that you guys went out and built your own buck and shoot and we're doing it when mom and dad weren't around because I feel like there's a lot of stories that start that way. Yeah. You know, mom, mom and dad were rodeo people. And, and when we were little kids, we'd, we'd all pile in the camper and go to the rodeo and, and, uh, you know, back in those days, mom and dad just opened the back door of the camper and the kids were gone and they, you know, we'd go play in the dirt with all the other rodeo kids and, and they never knew, knew where to find us until the bull riding came up. And then they knew I'd be at the arena somewhere watching. And, and I can remember this is in the documentary. So I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I remember I had these little pointy toed boots and I'd grab that chain link fence and I'd pull myself and I'd stick those little pointy toes of my boots through the chain link. And I'd just stand there and watch them bulls. And, and I loved it. So that's kind of how it all started. And uh, yeah, mom and dad left. They, they didn't support me riding bulls and, and didn't want me to for, for good reason. You know, I'm a parent now and, and I never pushed it to my kids. And 
always said that if they wanted to do it, I would help them. And my, my oldest son got on four bulls that one summer and decided it wasn't for him. Thank God. But you know, they, they didn't really support me doing it and they left town and we had a bunch of rope and steers there. They left town for a week and my brother and I built us a little old wooden buck and shoot out there with, with pallets and, and this old wire gate. And we put the gate on backwards and you guys will know what this means, but you know, a lot of people won't. So we, so, so the, the shoot gate opened at their head instead of their tail. And as soon as they, and we didn't know, we didn't know what we were doing. So I'd be sitting in there on this steer and my brother would be opening the gate and the gate opened at his head. So as soon as that gate cracked, that steer would see that, that opening and he would go and it would just rip me off the back, you know, cause it, the, the, there's no clearance there. Kind of hard to understand for people that don't know what I'm talking about, but but I bet I, your knees felt pretty good. Oh yeah, but yeah, that. just rip you off right on the post, right on your knee. And I'd mm. look at my brother, I'd get myself up off the ground, and I'd say, "Man, you got to open the dang gate faster! Come on!" And he's like, "That's as fast as I can open it." And Dad came home, and <laughs> he looked at it, and he said, "Well, yeah, you guys did good, but you got the gate on backwards." And he switched, <laughs> he switched the gate to where it opened at their butt instead of their head. And you know, when it opens at their butt, then they see it's open before they leave. And, and you, you usually get a clear shot that way, but uh, we didn't know what he was doing. And so, you know, Don took pictures of the buck and shoot. It's sitting right out here, but uh, yeah, I've still got it. Uh, Dad and grandpa had had our welder there at the ranch, go measure the fairground buck and shoots and come back and build me one. So we were set then. So I won't get too crazy about your riding career because I think people can find that on the internet, but also we want to leave some, some material. So people want to watch the documentary at the end of the day, but Don, without being from a strong rodeo background, was it shocking for you to not only see injuries happen, but just listen to the things that Ty had been through? I wouldn't say eye opening. I, I think it gave me a different perspective. You know, I've covered NFL and, and other athletic sports and there's injuries there but they have the best of the, of the, you know, medical attention that they get. The thing I I feel that is quite unique is the grit and the determination that goes into it. And I think that's much different than many other sports. I I recall seeing a, a, a short clip of JB Mooney, where he said he was sitting in between two, two huge athletes, a football player and a hockey player. I think when he was in the green room at ESPN and, and I remember him just saying, I'm sitting there, this, short little tiny guy next to these two guys who are monstrous. And, and I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but uh, it was something to the effect that, you know, what am I doing here with these guys? And they actually were saying, you're a heck of a lot tougher than we are. You know, you get on a, an animal that could potentially kill you. We're just hitting each other and, and stuff. And so a, a different type of appreciation came into it, not just that the guys are crazy. There is that element to it, I think, but it's also them challenging themselves. They're, they're battling against themselves. Often it just happens to be on a bull. And then of course, as you, at the, at the level you rise to uh, one of the things I noticed, then it becomes that challenge of how can I figure this bull out to stay on him for that eight seconds. So that I think probably is where I was most surprised, you know, having been in sports my entire career, as a producer or director with ESPN and NBC sports, I, I was up close to that and I got to see that and I got to talk to some of the athletes about that. But this, this was a whole different uh, level and it gave me a huge appreciation for what goes into it, not just from the writer's perspective, but from the bulls perspective and, and the stock contractors perspective, you know, it's a lot like thoroughbred horse racing where you have the jockeys and the trainers um, which are, are mostly what people hear about, but then it's the, the, the actual horses and the bloodlines that go into it. And then you've got the owners and how that relationship works. There's so many elements that make thoroughbred horse racing happen. And it's very similar to the bull business. And, and as much as it's grown, it's, it's become even more important. So yeah, that appreciation is definitely something that uh, has been an experience for me. And for me to be able to share that in, in the form of this documentary is something that I hope people will come to appreciate and understand. I think that's a really good segue to go into the production side of it. So Ty, for people that aren't familiar with what 
what it takes to really put on a bull riding and you don't have to give your whole playbook, but maybe do you want to just kind of briefly touch on the difference between just bringing bulls to an event like you just did in Billings here last weekend versus when you're actually going out there and producing an event? Uh, sure. You know, they're, they're, they're both hard work. And as we've talked about the, the feeding and the exercising and, and everything it takes to, to take bulls to an event, and, and have them buck at the top level, you know, that's hard work, but it's quick. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of work back here at the house, but then you get to go have fun on the weekend to, to buck your bulls at an event. Now that production deal, that's, I I love it, but it is, it is hard work. You know, it's almost a year process from when we finish Castle Rock, uh, you might take a month or so off, but then you're, you're starting to make calls. You're, you're, you're always thinking about things to make it better, to make it better for the spectators, make it better for the bull riders, make it better for the bull teams. And, um, you're always kind of thinking how to make it better. Well, that's a good point. And, uh, speaking of, of that, I lo- I really enjoyed that part of the film kind of showed how you were producing that event and, how everybody just seemed to have a good time and how that that was your main focus and main priority. I'm not saying in the rodeo world, but in a lot of, uh, well, I'll say concerts or any other kind of venues, their main focus is not how much fun somebody's going to have. Theirs is how much money are we going to make from this particular event? And I like your approach better. <laughs> Well, I, I, I got to admit, you know, I appreciate you saying that, but you, you kind of get into a, to a production mode and it's maybe a little bit of a different hat or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I, I always look back after, after an event that I produce and you always have regrets, you know, you, you tried to rush somebody too much or you said something you shouldn't have. And while you want to give everybody, you have to give everybody a fair shot. But while you want to give everybody ample time to get their job done, you've got to rush them sometimes. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got the contestants that you want to give a fair shot to, but you've got the spectators that paid money. And if you want them back, you've got to make it a good show. And the, you know, the last thing they want to do is just sit there and sit there and sit there with nothing happening. And if you want to produce events, you can't always be a nice guy. And I'm, you know, I'm not proud of that. And I, you know, I always have regrets and I've got some people mad at me still from this last February event. And, um, and I hate that, but you know, they, they, I've got to understand and they, uh, you know, I hope they can understand too, that, you know, we'll give you the time that you need, but it's a production and we got to keep it moving. And, and and while I say that you said, you said fun, it, 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 I, I love it. It is fun. And, you know, I'm not good at much, but I am kind of good at the production part of it. And, um, you know, I, I definitely have fun, but you kind of have to be a little bit of a, I don't even know what you call it, but <laughs> kind of a grouch, I guess, to, to, to during the event to produce those things. Because you've got, to, you know, we buck, we buck 50 bulls on that two o'clock performance. We have military appreciation. We have an intermission so people from the crowd can go to the vendor's couple of oh we've got the mini bucking bulls and you know we try to make it a two-hour show and you've got to keep it clicking we buck 100 bulls that day two performances one at two and one at 7 p.m and so it's got to move and sometimes you're not always very popular when you know and I, I say things I shouldn't you know Don had me mic'd up for two and a half years and there's a lot of things he had to cut out of the (laughs) <laughs> out of the out of the the deal because i i forget that i'm mic'd up and and you know i'll i'll say a cuss word and or cuss words and anyway i'm not proud of that but just kinda. well and i will just say that you know as a as a filmmaker you obviously have to make edits i never included anything that wasn't relevant to the story that i was trying to tell or that i kind of discovered uh, you know as as we went along so there's no there was no particular editing to make Ty look good or bad. It was just whatever fit the flow of the story. So oh, he made um, me look good. I'll tell you that. And, <laughs> and I've, I've told so many people, man, he chose an average guy with an average story and Don Cardona created something amazing. And I, and I'll, I'll, I'll never say anything different. And I'm, I'm not just saying that I believe it and I know it. So, so thank you, Don. Yeah. And well, thank you. And, and, and just kind of recapping what Ty was just saying about that event. 
producing a bull riding event is very similar to producing a television broadcast from a remote. So all the work and preparation that goes into it, and then you, you're running cables to the cameras, you're setting up the cameras, you're, you're making sure that the timing is on. And you're actually, as a broadcaster, you are reacting to the event. So it's, it's like Ty is one and brought, you know, in this hit, this particular event and the live broadcast would be one a, you know, you, it's almost like you'd have to be in sync. We haven't televised that. Hopefully we'll get to that point uh, with his event. Cause I think it's turning into something special, but it's it, the workflow is very similar to what goes into a, a remote TV broadcast out of a TV truck. And, and, and I think that's maybe why, I was able to capture some of the things that I did. Um, we had a private screening last uh, in March of 2021. And some of the people that I invited had nothing to do with the sport. They didn't know it. They didn't understand it. And some of the, some of the feedback that I got was, and this surprised me was one, one woman told me that she really loved seeing how everything was set up the gates and, and the arena and the dirt being pulled in. She's like, I was fascinated by that stuff. And that, that wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting something with the bulls or the writers, the schools, but that was the first thing out of her, of her mouth with her comment. And I'm like, Oh, I found it interesting too, I guess. And so as a filmmaker, you know, if it's interesting to you, chances are, it's going to be interesting to somebody else. And that just was kind of a happy accident. I do think that's part of the industry that even people that watch regularly on TV, they don't see. It's, it's not shown very much. And besides the fact of, you know, getting it all set up and ready to ride bulls in an event, like what you're doing, there's a hundred bulls and there's, you know, how many different contractors. So not only the people that help set it up and take it down, but you've got to have people in the back that are able to keep all that straight. And I know you talk about that in the documentary, but when you're dealing with a hundred plus bulls from however many different guys, they've got to be on their game back there. And it's, it can't be easy to find people that you really trust to do that or handle that task because there's just not that many of them out there. No, nah, there aren't. And we, we take 33 bull teams and each team has three bulls. So that's 99 bulls. And we buck, you know, we, we had one re-ride this past year, which made it a hundred head bull riding. But uh, so we've got 33 different stock contractors bringing three bulls. And sometimes a guy will bring three bulls and they've got to be three individual pens. You know, they can't, none of them go together. And yeah, so, so we've got to load them into the bucking shoots out of those three individual pens. Well, when you send them back after they buck, they've got to make sure those bulls go back to those same pens. You know, I mean, it'd be really easy to accidentally stick them in, the, in one pen together and, and then have a heck of a fight and have a bull hurt. And so, yeah, this this past year, my two boys did it, Tanner and Tucker, and they did amazing. And um, yeah, my my youngest son Tucker twisted his ankle back there, and I had a bunch of doctors and therapies after after the event. But he didn't quit. He jumped off a gate, and he didn't land flat footed, and then twist it. He landed with his foot to the side, and it you know tore some ligaments and and um but he didn't quit you know they him and tanner they just kept going all night and uh and we got some great stock contractors that pitch in and help back there so so it works good that's awesome uh speak we talked to don a little bit about this and i'm going to talk to you directly about this ty was there anything that you learned about yourself during the process of making this film that's a good question i i do say in the film that you know, one thing that I've realized that I learned through the years and the film kind of kind of confirmed it was just how much I've loved these bulls my whole life. You know, and and I really thought growing up that 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 bull riding was my forever deal and 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 what I really wanted to do. And and as I grow older and, and spend more time around these bulls, I, I remember looking back and going to a bullpen at a rodeo and just standing on the on the fence and, and, and just watching those animals for, for hours. And so I, I think one thing that I've realized through the years is, is that I, I, I just, I, I love being around these animals and that was probably a bigger part for me than, than actually liking to, to ride them. So I don't know, Don, help me out on that one. I, I think, you know, Ty mentioned it earlier, you know, when you're in that production, you're yelling and screaming and, and, and that is, 
you're in business mode and, you know, in TV and when you're in a TV truck, it's the same way. And a producer will yell at a director and that producer will yell at the graphics person for being late. And the director will yell at the cameras because you're trying to, you know, to, to have, you have a common goal to, to make that the best you can. Once you're done, everyone's friends, everyone, you know, have, have, go have a drink and stuff like that. And I think maybe that's what I, I kind of observed about Ty and why he's had those people that he's worked with come back year after year after year, he'll yell at them. And, and I've, and I've observed that, but it's nothing personal. It's just get the job done just like any other industry, I would say, but, but with this, you're dealing with potential life and death. And so there is an element of urgency with that. I think the other thing too, um, maybe that I learned uh, from Ty or, or about Ty was how many people know him that I wasn't aware and how many people respect him as a stock contractor. I think, you know, many years have passed since they realized how good of a bull rider he was, but just seeing that, oh, this person, I, I was getting my hair cut, uh, you know, locally and I was wearing my buck and bulls vest. Uh, I had just got them. It was kind of something that I made for myself and a couple of people that helped me, which now people are buying, which I'm really happy about. But this woman cutting my hair asked me if I was a bull rider. And I said, no, but I made a movie about it, explained it to her a little bit. And she says, she says, who's in it? And I said, hi, Ronaldo. And she's like, oh, I know Ty. <laughs> so it's just, you know, and I don't think she had a connection to him, but she knew him. So I think that's one of the things that I learned most about Ty in, the, in this whole process is how well regarded he is. Yeah, I, I told Don this too when we talked on the phone is... <laughs> The passion that you have, Ty, it was beaming all over the place. And you can't fake stuff like that. And it and it shows like the effort you put into putting on an event and the effort you put into your bulls, like to me, it was really apparent. And obviously to bring bulls to the level that you will bring bulls to, like a UTB event, it doesn't go without a lot of effort. And I think both of you were kind of like a dynamic duo where Don gave you the outlet to really show people that. And Don on the other side got to learn a whole different side of something that he didn't know much about. And I think it ended up being such a great product. Like I love the documentary and I think everybody who watches it will get that feeling. So I thought both of you guys did an excellent job and I wish there was more documentaries like that out there for people, because I do think there's a strong market for it. And like what we, me and Don talked about as well when you're watching that sport on TV, it's about the competition. You know, at the end of the day, that's what they're there to film. So some of that stuff kind of gets shoved by the wayside. And I think bringing that to the forefront is really awesome for the industry and people that want to know more about the industry as well. That well said. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So I guess uh, the only other thing that I would like to ask and, and we'll ask both of you, and it might be easier for Don to answer. I'm not sure, but how much do you guys know about fantasy sports and what do you think about fantasy sports and bull riding? Because me and James, we both know Bonner Bolton, who has came up with rank ride fantasy that gives people the opportunity to play fantasy bull riding every week on the UTB level. And what do you think that can add to a fan's experience or even just someone who likes fantasy sports and wants to give it a shot and they start watching bull riding. Well, uh, you know, when I was at, at ESPN, I would play fantasy baseball. And I think what those platforms do in, in addition to engaging is it educates you because you have to study the, the players and, and the teams and the matchups and, you know, a pitcher batter, you know, and I'll just talk baseball because I know it most the, the most, but I think, you know, in terms of bull riding, it's bringing people more into the sport as a, as a fan. And, 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 and it kind of almost treats you as you, you well know, as a general manager on formulating this whole team and, and your strategy and your processes. But, but I think one of the things that really intrigued me and, and, and part of the reason that I wanted to, to, to make, uh, well, again, starting off as just clips for YouTube, but what turned into a documentary was I wanted to know about the bulls and, and, and because they're just as much, I mean, 
Chase Outlaw says it in there, you know, they're 50% of the sport. And so when you know that they have different personalities and different athletic traits and, and tendencies, it really kind of makes people, I think, more involved. And, and James said it earlier too, it's on television more now. So you're more exposed to it or you're more connected if you are a fan and, and making that into this whole process, I think just helps the appreciation for the sport. Yes. It's entertainment. Yes. It's, 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 it's something that people will enjoy, but when you can understand like bodacious and a little yellow jacket, and I mean, who had who now has a statue, like this is how much I've come to know this sport, these hall of fame bulls. It's not just, they were the best bulls. What made them who they were? You know, they have their own essence. And and that's what I appreciated just by hanging around with Ty for so many, you know, for the couple of years that that we did this. And and the fantasy deal, some some people love to compete. Lots of people love to compete. And when you get too old to compete physically, you know, you still want to stay involved. And and I was in the fantasy football league one year and it was a blast. You know, like Don said, you you study the players and learn who you can get. And, and you watch the games and see how your guys do and how many yards they acquire and how many passes they catch and all the stuff. And, and you become a fan and, and you're able to compete. And that's, that's fun for a lot of us old guys that can't physically do it anymore. And I'll just add in the, in the brief conversations that I had with James, um, his knowledge of this sport is, is unbelievable. And I've, you know, listened to a couple of your podcasts and, and I'm just blown away. Like, I thought I was getting familiar, but then I hear James and I'm like, oh, wow, I got a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Ty, I actually did use a milk mustache for my team last week in Billings. So, oh, really? Yep. Oh, yeah, no, he, that probably didn't go very good then, did it? No, he, he did. He did just fine for me. He did just fine. But, uh, because he, he hipped himself and they gave a rewrite on him. So, I'm, I'm not sure how that works for the fantasy deal. Did they buck him twice? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, as long yeah. as they if they buck twice the way it's set up now, you've got a pretty good leg up. So okay, like good. a lot of times that's what I end up trying to do is figure out, make an educated guess about what bulls I think they could bring back. I kind of have a general understanding of how they work those events, just being at so many of them. So that's kind of what I like to do. But I agree with what you said. And I play a lot of fantasy football as well. And man, like like last week, the draft was on. Uh, me and my roommate getting us out of the TV Friday, uh, Thursday through Saturday was pretty tough. But uh, yeah, speaking of, let, me, let me tell one quick story. Speaking of milk mustache, so he was in the alley last weekend at Billings, and he was the next one to go in the buck and shoot. But they had him staged back there. They had a Flint was doing an act or whatever, and and this guy I saw him, and he was like upside down looking looking like under his face kind of and I was standing there kind of wondering what he was looking at and 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 then I realized what he was looking for and I said did you see it and he said no I can't see it and he was looking for the for the white lip which he does have solid black bull milk mustache and he does have a white lip so that's Guess crazy I didn't notice that on tv that's yeah cool. it's, yeah so my last thing I want to bring up before we let you guys go, we definitely appreciate you guys spending time with us, but in this, in the documentary, it talks about your relationship with Mike Campbell and how he really affected your life in such a positive way. And then it also talks about in memory of JC and that was your high school sweetheart. Correct. Ty. Yes. And obviously everybody's had to lose people that they're really close with. And that's not an easy thing to do but we would like to just send out our condolences and make this in memory of both Mike and JC because they're such a a big role in your life and people should definitely appreciate the important people in their life because you don't know when it's going to end. That means a lot. I appreciate it. You know, Mike Campbell was, was who I looked up to more than anybody growing up as a bull rider. And he was a local kid and I was four years younger than him. And he really took me in, you know, and uh, where nobody else really did. And and uh, Mike just uh, took me under his wing, and and I appreciated him. And I I as as I said in the in the movie, I I liked him as a man and respected him as a man and a, and a bull rider. I remember he drew a bull at a rodeo that I was at with him, and the stock contractor 
uh, Mike asked about the bull and the stock contractor said, yeah, if you ride this bull, you're going to win the rodeo. And I'll, you know, I, I remember the look on Mike's face when he said that and just like this. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you. And Mike did win the rodeo that, that weekend. And, and he was winning the state high school bull riding. He had as many points as you could actually acquire that year and didn't even need to go to this rodeo that he went to. And, um, and he was, he was killed at that rodeo. And, um, you know, that was, that was really hard, but, uh, made it through that and, and just appreciated all of his teaching through the year and, and the friendship that I acquired with his family. And, um, and then, as you said, my, my high school, my high school girlfriend, JC Hendricks, um, we got together two years ago and, um, got back together and, um, and she passed away uh, almost a year ago, um, May 21st, 2021, she passed away. And, you know, really appreciate all she did for me in a short two year span. And like Mike, you know, gained great friendships with her, with her family and her parents and talked to him almost every day. And, and uh, so I hope they get to watch this. And can I just jump in real quick and, and say, there, there's a couple of things. My Colorado premiere of the film theatrical is on May 21st. And so I think that's more than just a coincidence that it's happening, you know, on, on the date that she left us. Um, but JC gave me so much information that I didn't have when I had my first draft. And so she contributed to the film very highly. Um, you know, a, a lot of people did, but you know, it, since we're talking about her, it was, it was really special. And then when, when it was Mike Campbell, I shot the trophy in Ty's, um, he has a little separate home that he rents out and all his trophies and, and bibs are in there. And, and I shot this trophy seeing what it was, but it didn't click for me until I talked to JC and JC kind of gave me that perspective. I did ask Ty about it, but at the time it wasn't a big part of the film, but then I realized how many of us have lost somebody that they've cared about that have kind of shaped the way we are. And the more I looked at it, it was really, that was probably the most tender part of the film. I, I think you might agree with, but it was also the most difficult to put together because it was so short how do you make something meaningful in that short amount of time? And it, with, with not having very many photos, with not having much to go on other than the trophy. And, and really the trophy became the character as part of that piece, in my opinion. I don't know how you feel about it, but, but it was really something that when I would watch it, you know, as a filmmaker, you watch what you're doing over and over and over again. And every single time I would look at it, it would be like, do I kill this part of it? Do I, do I, lose this part of it or do I keep it? And the more I was trying to shape that, the more compelling it became every single time I watched it. So to me, when, when I hear both of you talk about that point of the film, it really makes it more special for me because I didn't know how important that is, but just knowing how it kind of shaped something like an event like that can shape the direction of someone's life is, is, is kind of pivotal. Well, I'm glad you guys understand the importance of that trophy to me. I mean, Mike was a guy that I idolized. I mean, I wanted to be a bull rider and he was the best and and we were friends and he showed me and taught me and and took me and and then to lose him in 1981 and then in 1984 I won, you know, they they gave his memorial trophy um, in 1981 was the first year. And then, I, and then, and his parents told me that year, they said, we're going to give this until you win it. And I'm like, Oh yeah, cool. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And, you know, just not, not thinking that I'd ever win it, but in 1984, I did win it. And that was the last year they gave it. And, and so I'm glad you guys, I'm glad it's, I, I'm glad you guys understand and, and realize what that trophy does mean to me. Absolutely. And thank you so much for your time and Don, you as well. And uh, Don, for people that want to watch the documentary or purchase it or anything like that, what, where can they find it and where can they access it at? So right now it is on DVD, which uh, people can, if they want to visit buckandbulls.com, not buckandbulls.com, buckandbulls.com. I do have it on DVD. There is a bonus feature on there about uh, Ty's cattle dog, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, so it's on my website. I am... Actually, this is a good time to announce that it will be on video on demand via Vimeo.com. So you can either uh, visit that or it should be on my uh, website soon as well. 
and it's such a great story. I recommend everybody going out there and watching it. It's definitely a high quality production and it tells a really awesome story. And I'm, I'm glad I've watched it twice now. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, just, uh, you mentioned it earlier, but it, to my surprise, it won best documentary and best cinematography at the sixth annual wild bunch film festival, uh, which is dedicated to the Western genre and, and just kind of a, a personal surprise. Uh, the, the, uh, Dear Rodeo, the story of Cody Johnson was also a uh, a competitor in that film. And so for that to have happened for this film that had zero budget was a complete surprise. So I, you know, just want to thank Ty again and, and thank you guys. You know, you have a great podcast. It's very entertaining and, and I enjoy listening to it. So. Well, thank yeah, you. We guys. appreciate that. But All thank right. you guys so much for joining us, Ty and Don. It's been, a, it's been a blast. Like you guys said, and, and we appreciate it. And I can definitely appreciate the project that you guys put out there. The product, it was definitely really good and I would recommend it to anybody. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Or we appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Guys. Thank you, man. It sure was fun getting to visit with Ty and Don. They're just awesome people. They have an awesome story that they captured together and it turned into a really amazing product. And I definitely recommend everybody go out there and watch it. You will not be disappointed. You can look at Don's website, buckin-bulls.com, or check it out on Vimeo On Demand. And we have a special promo code for you guys to use if you want to watch it on Vimeo. And that promo code is all capitals, BACKPEN5. So I will put that in the episode description as well. And I've said this a hundred times already, but definitely go watch it, guys. If you're into bull riding, rodeo, bucking bulls, or just a good story, you're not going to be disappointed. This is an awesome film. I've watched it twice and it is just an amazing product. There's no doubt about it, but I think that'll wrap it up for today until next time. Have a great one and come back and visit us again from the back pans. Mm-hmm.